all these mindset myths that I say are out there, people believe in this stuff. And then it weakens people because they start to believe oh, in that lie. That's a fact, that is what it is. So listen to the negative voices that come into your head because they're not from you. Talk to yourself with words of encouragement. Are you big on life. like the affirmations of like speaking to yourself in the mirror and stuff? No. <laughs> like, you just, you are great. People like me, I'm successful. <laughs> I look at them like, dude. But I do believe that as a man thinks, he becomes. So how do you heal yourself and how do you start thinking positive and get rid of the energy vampires and everything else? It starts with such basic things that make a big difference. Like, What's up, Wealth Builders? Today, I've kind of lost my voice, but it's all good because I have one of the best communicators in the world. This man has had 15 best-selling books, 28 books in total. You might know him from the energy bus. This guy's absolutely crushing. I've had the chance to play pickleball with him, to play golf with him. He actually is an extremely good pickleball player. We are working on his golf game. I got none other than John Gordon. What's up, man? Ryan, great to see you. And yes, I definitely need to work on my golf game. But your pickleball game is strong. Oh yeah, pickleball game is, is strong. How often are you playing? Only about like every day? No, nah, like once a week. And a lot of times when I'm not home, I'm traveling so much. I haven't played in months. Yeah. But I play enough that when I do play, I get better and better. Yeah. You're like, uh, well, Florida's like the official state for pickleball, I feel like. Oh, yeah. Warm Everybody. weather. People are playing. But but they think of pickleball as like being old. Like you have to be old to play pickleball. It's, well, it it's was. It's an athletic sport now. Yeah. It was like an old person's game, but now everyone plays. Oh, yeah. I have a pickleball court. So it's just like. When are we playing? We're going to play right after this. All right, let's go. Yeah. So, dude, I mean. <laughs> I've got to get you back for the beating that you gave me on the golf course. <laughs> yeah, you give me a beating on the pickleball course for you sure. You have, I got to tell you, one of the best swings I've ever seen. I mean, it is incredible how you hit the ball. So I know people see your videos, but yeah, yeah. in person, it's just incredible. I appreciate that. That means a lot. So how long have you been an author now? Since I was in my early 30s. Uh-huh. I didn't always... I think I was going to be an author. I was in business. I owned restaurants. Yeah. Second mortgage, our home, $20,000 in credit cards to open up the first Moe's Southwest Grill in, in Jacksonville, Florida. First Moe's in Florida, actually. Mm. And there's now over, you know, three, 400 Moe's now, but we were the, the first. And so I was, I was doing that. Hey, what made you think like Moe's would take off? I was in Atlanta and there was a few Moe's in Atlanta. And I was in the bar business in Atlanta. I owned a bar called park bench. Since I was 24 years old, I bought a bar. When I was getting my master's in teaching, I was bartending. Mm -hmm. And as I'm bartending, the guy next door to me that owned this place, I was on the corner with him. And I said, Hey, would you ever sell your place? He goes, everything's for sale. <laughs> so at 24, I decided to buy this bar. I didn't have a lot of money, but I found investors. And when my grandmother died, she had left me $30,000. So that's money I had since I was like 18 years old, <laughs> put it into mutual funds and then took that money and invested it in that bar. So now I'm 24 and turned that place into a really, really successful place. It was like a hot spot in Buckhead. Met my wife three weeks after opening up that bar in Buckhead. Was she a customer? No. Okay. She was walking by. Okay. I She's was like, outside. I don't want none of that. Yeah. She had no interest in the bar business or actually <laughs> no interest in me at first either. Okay. But- being in that business, Moe's was, was doing well as, a, as an upstart. And I noticed it was really, you know, very successful. And I loved the concept. It was easy. So years later, when I would move to Jacksonville, I thought about, you know, maybe I'll get back in the business. If I did, I would only do a Moe's. I wouldn't want to do a restaurant. I would open up a place like that that would be easy to run, easy to operate, and make money. I knew I wanted to write and speak in, in my early 30s. So the goal was to open up the Moe's, make enough money that would allow me then to write and speak. Okay. So how did Moe's do? Did well. Well, at first it didn't do well. I mean, at first no one heard You don't of even Moe's. know what you're doing right. at that time. I'm 29, 30 years old. Yeah. Fast build, cash. Build my, build my first restaurant, hiring people, trying to operate it, market it. My wife and I would literally flyer the movie theater nearby in all the cars. So we'd fly to those car, fly to those cars. We would go out and sell caterings to the local businesses. We were trying to make this place successful. Almost went bankrupt several times, like, like hanging by a thread, like one week, barely broke even another week broke even. I got a consulting job in wireless technology for, for six weeks of consulting that made enough money to carry us and that restaurant for, for a few more months. And as that last dime ran out, we made our first profit. What made it successful was I decided to advertise. 
So I took whatever money we had, put it into advertising, did some really cool ads. Next thing you know, people were flocking in, started making money. Turned that Moe's into the number one Moe's in the entire franchise. That's more and more opened Whoa. up around, around the country. And we were still like just crushing it. Eventually opened up four of them in Jacksonville. Hmm. Sold them in 2005. But, but I think what worked was, again, marketing. I began an email list all the way back in 2002, 2003, where we were sending email out- Email was just like new. Just beginning. And yeah. there was no email marketing. So I was collecting all these email addresses of my customers. Mm. And people that I knew around the city, I would get their emails. Whenever we'd open up a new store, we would send out a free burrito. Just bring your email in. Yeah. People would then- they e print their email? <laughs> yes. It was that simple. People yeah. would actually then, they would actually- email those emails to everybody else, those mm -hmm. offers. So it spread throughout the entire city. So we would have hundreds and hundreds of new people, of people coming in. Again, we gave away a lot of burritos, but it was way worth it. instantly knew who we were, built up the brand, built up the market. The big mistake I made though, was I allowed other people to come in and open other Moe's stores. Oh, you should have got buy exclusivity. The entire rights. Good friends of mine opened up four or five of them around the city and near mine. Yeah. It's a, it's and a you did all the work for them, but it's a great story because I didn't get mad. I didn't sue. I didn't do anything like that. We became friends. I even helped them at times. They wind up buying my Moe's when I knew I wanted to sell out and focus on writing and speaking 100%. Mm. So it actually worked out really well. These guys bought my Moe's, gave me about a million dollars. Yeah. Gave them my Moe's and I was done. I was out. Happiest day of my life was the day I sold those modes. Were you just like kind of over that business? You had a new passion for writing and speaking or what, what brought you to that point of just being done with it? Cause it was successful. It was successful. It was making money, but it was draining. Yeah. And running restaurants, restaurants, a tough business. Were you, you were the actual operator like in it? Well, no, I had, I had, I had a area manager at that point who was running the restaurants. I was handling the marketing, but there was always some issue. You know, <laughs> there was always some challenge. I mean, you know, running a business, even this yeah. business is challenging. Oh Yeah. Then you deal with people who, who were making $7 an hour probably at the time. Yeah. People who are stealing money at the register. People who are stealing food. People who are stealing pans out the back. You're always dealing with, with all of those issues. So, so that was frustrating. But, but also I just knew like I wanted to write and speak. Like this was my calling. This is what I was meant to do. God literally showed me this was my path. I was going to an event to speak to Chubb Insurance on the West Coast flying from Jacksonville. On my way there, I'm reading a business magazine. It said, how to know when to sell your business. I thought, oh, uh, I'm maybe, maybe I'm supposed to sell. On the way back, a different magazine. It said, how to value your business <laughs> when selling. I walk in, I said, honey, we are selling it. God gave me the signs. We are selling it. And sure enough, it really was meant to be that time. We were meant to sell, and we did. Yeah. And after that, just didn't take off right away. But I said, I'm going to focus on writing and speaking. Now, Writing and speaking wasn't successful at the time. It, it was a it was risk. A passion. It, it was a passion, but it was a risk in many ways because Catherine said, when I sold the most, she goes, she goes, what happens if it doesn't work? Like, it's not like you're being successful right now as a writer and speaker. You want to do this, but you're doing like one a month, one engagement a month. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's actually talk about that because like how many books had you written to that point? At that point, I had written one other book. So you wrote one book one and book. you were getting one speaking engagement a month. Yeah. And it wasn't doing well. Now I did get on the today show with this book and we thought my career was going to take off from that. It was a, it was a four week series on the today show, mm. but it's weird. Like it didn't take off. Like there was a week or two of a, a big bump. The show went great. Like I, I crushed it on that show. I was coaching three people on their energy and their positivity for their work and their career. And we did an energy makeover over that time to see the impact I had on their lives. And yeah. it really went well. So people are like, oh, your career's going to take off. Like, this is it. Yeah. And I thought this was it. Now, there was a reason why I didn't take off. I wasn't a person of faith at that time. Mm. I didn't have faith in God. So yeah. I write this book, which was about physical, emotional, and spiritual energy, but in a very hodgepodge kind of way. Yeah. Very new age way. New agey, of... new agey kind of way. Yeah. So, so... I do that show and again, have the quick bump, but then it doesn't take off. So now I sell the restaurants. I want to focus on this. I'm in the wilderness. It's not going well. And now I'm praying every day as I'm walking. Who are you praying to? At that point, I'm praying to God. Okay. God, help me, God. 
God, mm -hmm. man, I got this pit in my stomach. God, I got this angst. God, what about my future? Like, what am I going to do? What happens if it doesn't work out? Like, I am just praying. Now, at that time, a friend of mine is giving me sermons from a guy named Erwin McManus. I know okay. you know Erwin. And yeah. I'm listening to these sermons from Erwin. These sermons are on CDs. This is how long ago it was. Wow. So I'm listening to these sermons, and they're speaking to me. So now I'm, I'm just crying out to God. I'm praying to God. And looking back, what I realized was I wasn't meant to take off because I had to actually be someone who would write the books I'm writing now. Mm -hmm. I would have to become someone who would actually be a person of faith and be able to share a message in a certain way. And it was during that time where during those walks, the energy bus came to me on a walk. And I said, that's it. That's the kind of book I'm going to write. Mm -hmm. And I wrote that book in three and a half weeks of just- During that time. During that time of, of divine inspiration. It was like, as I was coming to faith, I'm writing this book. I eventually get baptized. People said they could actually sense the energy mm -hmm. in that book change as I was actually changing yeah. as a writer writing that book. It was re really, really cool. When I look back on it, it was a really <laughs> special and very spiritual time in, in many ways. So again, sometimes you have to lose a goal to find your destiny. Like I had to lose this goal of thinking I want to be successful as this guy with this book, but I wasn't meant to be successful with that book. I was meant to actually then write this book about business and life and faith. And even though it's not a book about faith, it's about a guy who, who has faith, who has to overcome or find his faith. Mm -hmm. So what year was that when you wrote Energy Boss? I wrote it in 2006, came okay. out in 2007. Sells more copies now than it did back then. Did it like pop off from the beginning? No, or not right away. So later, it just- 100 copies first week, maybe 200 the second week. What made it catch fire? It took five years for that book to be a bestseller. Like what happened? I spoke on that book a lot. And I worked with the Jacksonville Jaguars in 2007. Jack Del Rio read the book, mm. reaches out to me out of the blue and says, hey, come be with me. Come, come to the facility. Jack Del Rio, are you kidding me? Like a legend as a player, now as a coach. So I go down and meet with him. I'm sitting across from him. And he said, hey, man, I, I loved your book. I love the thought about energy vampires. Man, I allow the media to get to me and they suck the life and energy out of me. Yeah. I realize I got to be more positive than they are negative. And so when he said that to me, I thought, you know, I wrote a book that would actually impact this coach. He said, hey, would you come speak to the team? I said, I'll speak to the team if you get a copy of that book for everybody on the team. He got a copy for everyone in the organization. So mm. everyone actually read the book, Food Service. Wow. Custodial staff. He wanted everyone on the bus sharing positive, contagious energy with his team. They had a great year that year, went to the playoffs, beat the Steelers in the first round. Like it was a magical season. There was a headline that did says- Did they have like Byron Leftwich at that time, I he, think? They did. David yeah. Garrod actually became- Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Became the starting quarterback that year and had a great year. Mm -hmm. And there was a newspaper article that said, Energy bus fuels Jaguars ride. So, so wow. that was like a big deal. That got out there. And then Mike Smith, when he became the head coach of the Atlanta Falcons, he was the defensive coordinator for Jack Del Rio. He goes to the Falcons, head coach. He brings me to the Falcons, and we do the same thing there. He gives the energy bus to all of the players. Matt Ryan was a rookie quarterback at that time. That's how long ago it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, a rookie at Been the time. Been around 20 years Oh, yeah, now. I know. I go there and speak, and, and there he is, a rookie and we've kept in touch since. So, so that's what started the book to get out there. But I also went on a 28-city tour when I wrote The Energy Bus. And I went from city to city sharing the message in the book. Remember, no social media. I was going to say, you, there was no other time. way to like get something out there. Yeah, so I'm going Traditional around. Traditional media tours. Yeah, local TV stations, local radio stations. We are reaching out to them. And we're like, hey, John Gordon's coming. He's internationally known. <laughs> <laughs> I've been um, to Mexico. <laughs> I, I had one friend in London, so I was internationally yeah. known. And the book became a bestseller in Korea, actually, right wow. when it first came out. So it was this massive success in South Korea, not North Korea, but a massive <laughs> success in South Korea, but, but not one bookstore Wow! in the United States would carry the book. Weird. So I go on this tour from every city. Bookstores start carrying the book because every city I go into, I'm going to the bookstores. Hey, do you have the books? So forth. But we have five people in one city, 10 people in another, 20 in another city. The most people we had were 100 people in Des Moines, Iowa. Yeah. They thought Jeff Gordon was coming. That's why they showed up the race car <laughs> driver. Oh, wait, this isn't Jeff Gordon. <laughs> this is John Gordon. <laughs> and so I got home. It was really the most inefficient kind of tour possible. I, I would probably never do it again, but I'm glad I did it then. because That was right when it got released, right? That was when it got released. 
but by doing that, I get booked to a school district as a result of someone who came to see me on the tour. A business leader saw me speak on that tour and he invited me to speak to his company. Jack Del Rio, I get back from the tour. That's when he read the book, invites me to speak. So after that, like this little foundation all of a sudden just starts to have a, a ripple effect and it starts to grow and grow and grow. And then there's the magic of the book where people read the book and it just speaks to them and they start sharing it. It's a very viral book and people buy it in like thousands of copies, hundreds of copies. And I have people over the country that just give this book out, 20 copies to all their friends, all their family. So that's, I think the reason it was just very viral and it just spread that way. But that was not my goal in a sense, like, oh, I'm gonna try to make this a viral book that spreads. Yeah. It just did. If you're watching this show, my guess is you're probably an entrepreneur who's trying to grow your business. And for me, the best thing I ever did to grow my business was build my personal brand on social media. It's allowed me to get more revenue, it's allowed me to raise more capital, and it's allowed me to hire better talent. And if you are not currently creating content for your brand, you're missing out and your competition is. So if you wanna learn to grow, my advice is to create a podcast. Now there's a lot that goes into building a podcast and why I believe it's the best way. So I've actually created a free training that I want you to go check out. If you go to panadamedia.com slash podcast, you can go access the free training right now and see how a podcast is going to be the best decision to grow your personal brand today. So go check it out by clicking the link below and I'll see you in the training. As you were doing this 28 city tour, you know, you, you go, there's only five people there. <laughs> right. Like, what was it? Were, were you disheartened? Oh, big time. Okay. Yeah, there were moments, I'm like, what am I doing? Yeah. Moments I wanted to give up. Moments I'm thinking, this is not going to work out. This is not going to be successful. I got sick in Kansas. I mean, r food poisoning sick, and I'm throwing up, and I got to go give this talk the next day to a local library where like 10 people are coming to see me. Yeah. But I did it. Here was my mission, to encourage and inspire as many people as possible, one person at a time. Mm -hmm. And I remember looking back, I was like, you know what? One person, John. You said one person. You didn't say a hundred at a time. Right. One person. There's six mm -hmm. people here. There's five people here. I was being taught to be faithful. You got to be faithful on the journey. Mm -hmm. And I was being taught with that. I look back, six people in one city. One woman was there. Years later, I get invited to speak to Avon. 6,000 women in the audience because that one woman that was there became president of Avon years later as a result of that. Wow. You know, I think it's just a good reminder for anyone listening, right? You know, we, we all have expectations and goals and things we want to do. And so I would say very rarely <laughs> do we hit our expectations when we try something, right. especially when it's new. Right. And so I've been in that scenario where I'm going to, I spend all this time working to throw a workshop or, you know, a big online event or even wealth con and like sales or tickets or something's not going the way we want it. And you're disappointed. And, and, and by the way, the disappointment happens like on the day right. because you're there and you're like, dude, you know, I did all this work. I spent all this money and the results not there like initially. And you're like, but Hey, we're here. Like, let's, let's just do it. And it's hard. But I think the, the main thing to understand is like you said, you just don't know what it's going to lead to. All you need is like the one right person in there that can really make a difference for it. I love that. And one of the rules of the energy bus is don't allow energy vampires to sabotage your ride. Mm -hmm. And also don't waste your energy on those who don't get on your bus. So not everyone is going to get on your bus, but you got to keep on driving. Yeah. You keep on asking more and more people to get on. So at first you're not going to be successful right away, but keep asking more and more to get on. Eventually you get a standing room only bus. Yeah. And so at first you're not going to be great. Very few people, as you know, are great right away. You're an amateur right away, and you're an amateur for a reason. Mm -hmm. But you gotta get better along the way. And I don't think I would have been ready if people were gravitating me towards me so soon because I wasn't a professional yet. I had to grow. Yeah, I had to improve. I had to get better. So I think there's a thing on timing, as you know, and also as people are coming to you, don't get discouraged. Just know that I'm building something. There's a, a process of building. I wrote a book called The Carpenter, and that's all about building greatness and anything worthwhile takes time to build because mm -hmm. that's where your character is developed. 
If you had immediate success, I wrote in the book, you wouldn't have the character you need to sustain success. Yeah, you don't know what it's like to go through something. So what gave you, I don't want to say the motivation or the knowledge or anything, but like this concept of energy and positivity and, and all these things that we're talking about here. Um, I mean, obviously you came from the business world. Hmm. Where did you get the concepts for these books? It's wild when you think about it because I could just say God, because it wasn't like I read Norman Vincent Peale on the power of positive thinking. Mm -hmm. I didn't read those books. Ken Blanchard was my mentor. He wrote the one minute manager. I would find out that he, Norman Vincent Peale was Ken Blanchard's mentor. Mm -hmm. He was mine. I was writing things and getting ideas for books that Norman Vincent Peale actually talked about years before. I was asked to write for his magazine, Guidepost and Positive Thinking Magazine, but yet had never read his books until I was asked to write for them. So I was getting a lot of those same ideas. I call them downloads. Like, I really feel like it's your calling. Yeah. It's, it's your mission. Like, I was put on earth to share this message at this time. And on my walks, on my prayer time, those ideas come to me. I'm obedient. And I just start sharing them. Yeah. I can't tell you like where these ideas came from. It wasn't like I read a book on that. A lot of these ideas were very new when the energy bus came out and I'm sharing these ideas. Now they're, you know, they're old hat. People go, Oh yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard that before. I'm like, yeah, because I've been talking about it for the last 17, <laughs> 18 years. Yeah. Right. But, but the idea of energy and positivity and essential, I've always thought of the world in terms of energy though. Like energy is everything. We are living in an energetic reality. Like within that underlying that is the spirit. It's the soul. It's the essence, like the spirit of God. But, but how do we make sense of this world? It's through energy, mm -hmm. wavelengths, frequencies, vibrations, or how we hear spectrums. Everything comes down to ultimately energy. So I really believe God created this existence that we live in, in an energetic reality for us to experience this reality. And under that is, is the soul and the spirit that, that drives this energetic reality, if that makes sense. Yeah. You and I were talking about something on the golf course. I cannot remember what I said that prompted you, but you were like, let me ask you a question. And it was about something with- Negative all, thoughts. Negative thoughts. Do your negative thoughts come from you? Yeah, exactly. Explain that. Yeah, I asked you, do your negative thoughts come from you? And you said- I was like, I guess, yeah. Yeah, I said, really? I said, if you believe your negative thoughts come from you, who would ever choose to have a negative thought? Mm -hmm. You would never choose one. Thoughts are always coming in. Like when you're having a dream, having a nightmare, are you choosing those thoughts? No. no. They're always coming in. There's this like internet cloud of consciousness. Thoughts are spiritual. And so we have this brain that's like an antenna. And it's the hardware. It's where the activation of the thought happens. But we're always downloading these thoughts that are coming in. And a lot of times you'll be driving, you'll get a thought. Yeah. Or you're getting on stage. Where's or it coming when, from? Or when you were playing baseball. Yeah. A thought pops in your head, sometimes a negative thought. And you'd be like, where did that come from? I wouldn't choose it, but it comes in. And so that's the spiritual battle that we face between the negative and the positive. And when I was talking to a young 16-year-old who was struggling with suicidal thoughts, he was beating himself up for the thoughts in his head, feeling guilt and shame for those thoughts. So he thought something was wrong with him. He felt broken. I said, no, you're not broken. There's nothing wrong with you. I said, you're the hero in your own epic story. We all are. And every hero has to overcome what? Villains, negativity, mm -hmm. adversity to define themselves, to create their future. How do they do that? They overcome the negative with the positive mm -hmm. belief yeah. and optimism. And that's the journey of life. That's the ultimate narrative of the universe. Good versus evil, positive versus negative, negative thoughts coming at you. How do you overcome them? with positivity, with yeah. belief, with optimism. I truly believe like this is the ultimate way that we, we create our reality, our future. And the, the Bible is filled being a person of faith. You see all the time. It's the battle of good versus evil mm -hmm. and the liar versus truth. Yeah. Negativity versus optimism, faith and belief. Yeah. How many times does Jesus say, fear not, fear not, mm -hmm. fear not, fear not. 366 times because fear is what holds you back. Mm. What casts out fear? Love. Love is more powerful than fear. So anytime fear comes in, how do you defeat fear? With love. I'm going to love what I do. Love the moment. Love the competition. Love the battle. Business-wise, 
Don't fear the competition. Love what you're doing. Love your customers. Love showing up every day, creating something new, loving selling, and you will rise above the competition and crush it in the world. Mm. No, I love that. So, I mean, your books appeal to everyone, right? Like they're not, um, I guess, Christian books per se, right? right? Like anyone can read them. Um, I would say it's very similar to my book with Wealthy Way. Like there's obviously Christian themes in there. I talk about faith, but anyone can read it, come away with great stuff. Uh, But when we talk about the spiritual battle, as you were just saying, right? There's energy, um, there's good versus evil. There's, you know, all these things happening. And the way I interpreted what you're saying is that, well, hey, I get these downloads directly from God. If I'm a person of faith, like I'm receiving these downloads as long as I'm open to it, right? But then I still can get, you know, there's a spiritual battle happening where, like you said, the liar, Satan, you know, demons and all of these things are, you know, also trying to get through and give downloads of their own. Like, how do you rectify that concept to people who don't believe it, it's hard to, but if you don't believe this, you don't understand it. We can go to it from the standpoint of your brain is an antenna. Mm-hmm. It's an antenna. You have 86 billion neurons on your brain. Every neuron has a transmitter and receiver. And there are two main frequencies that you can tune into positive and negative. Those are the two main frequencies. It's why everything comes down to positive and negative in this world. So you try to make sense of it that way, understanding positive and negative, understanding the old Cherokee story. It's not a religious story. It's a Cherokee story, ancient, you know, a native American story, two wolves inside of us, positive and negative. They fight all the time. Which one wins the fight? The one you feed the most, you feed the positive wolf or the negative wolf. That's a story of two frequencies, positive and negative. So what I did in my book, the one truth, because You're right. My books do appeal to everyone. And I don't write for just a Christian audience. I write for business leaders. I write for for teenagers. I write for teachers and athletes and coaches and you name it. I write for the everyday person who's struggling with negativity or they just want to be better, raise their game, have a better mindset, a more positive mindset. They want to be a better leader. They want to build a stronger team. They want to build a great culture. I write a lot about that. Some of my books are more inspirational in nature with fables and so forth that I write. And some are more like, hey, like the garden. The garden's about the battle of good versus evil, Mm -hmm. explaining it straight up and and, and straight out. But for someone who doesn't get this, it really is helpful to understand that. Look out in the world. Do you see, do you see evil? Do you see killings? Do you see murder? Do you see greed? Do you see all the people that how they're struggling and what they're struggling against. Do you see people do things that just betray logic or, or compassion or goodness? Where does that come from and why does it exist in the first place? Mm-hmm. So I think most people will agree that there's some sort of evil that, that does exist. There's some sort of bad in the world or negative force. What's the answer to that? Well, it's the positive force. Let's go to Star Wars. Okay. If, you, if you're not a believer in terms of a religion, you can love Star Wars and say, what is that about? <laughs> yeah. That is about the dark side and the Jedi. It's about good versus evil. What is Black Panther about? Good versus evil. Evil. Yep. Superman. Good versus evil. Mm-hmm. Every major epic movie is about good versus evil because that's the narrative within our own soul. And it's why we resonate with those movies so much. So I think the person who understands this and maybe doesn't believe once they start seeing this play out, the logic of it is, oh, this exists. There's something going on here that's that's beyond me. And here's the key. You are the intersection. Your brain is literally the intersection of this battle going on versus good versus evil. And it's playing out in your mind. There's a battle going on for your mind. We have to teach people how to win the battle. Mm. Because once you win the battle, you become more powerful and you help others along the way. When you heal yourself, you help others heal. So how do you heal yourself and how do you start thinking positive and get rid of the energy vampires and everything else? Well, I mean, it starts with such basic things that make a big difference, like gratitude. People talk about gratitude all the time, but just being grateful is a great way to fuel yourself and feed yourself with positivity. When I was at the peak of my negativity, which I'm not naturally a positive person, people should know. I struggle with it big time. So much so my wife almost left me because mm. 
actually, I was so negative. And so <laughs> when she almost left me, I said, okay, I got to be more positive. And I started doing research and I found you can't be stressed and thankful at the same time. So I went and started walking every day, practicing gratitude while I walked. I would just say what I was thankful for. And what was I doing? When I look back, I was actually rewiring my brain from negative to positive. I was tuning my brain, the antenna, to the positive frequency by focusing on the positive instead of the negative. So that is a big game changer right there, just practicing gratitude. What else can you do? Mindfulness is great. Prayer is incredible. What is mindfulness? Mindfulness is where you really get yourself in the present moment. So wherever you are, whatever moment you're in, you're really focusing on the here and now. Your <coughs> thoughts are not in the past. Your thoughts are not focusing on the future, worrying about the future. You're just right here, right now. So we're in a conversation. I'm only focused on you. Mm -hmm. It's about being in the zone. When you're playing golf, you're very mindful of, mm -hmm. of the ball, of your club, of the position on the course, of where the hole is. You're very mindful. That's why you probably love Self -aware, golf. Self-aware, mindful, yeah, it, it's intentional. Intentional. But mindful is like your mind is not wandering. It's very focused. So, Got it. So that's, people practice that. And the more you practice that, people find that's very helpful. People meditate. Different religions, people meditate. Regardless of your religion, that is actually very helpful to meditate. And Buddhist meditation is helpful for a lot of people. And as a former new ager who practiced that, it was actually very helpful for me when I became a follower of Jesus, actually. Because mm -hmm. it taught me the practice of prayer. Right. The practice <clears throat> of listening to the voice of God. The practice of tuning in every day to the spirit instead of the world. Right. And so that made a huge impact on me along the journey. So prayer is, is helpful. But one of my favorite tips for anyone who wants to be more positive, before you go to bed, focus on your one success of the day. Just create a success journal. It's so simple, but so powerful. Yeah. What was your success today? Do this with your kids. And every night they go to bed, they feel like they're a success. Mm -hmm. They wake up. They're now a success. They're literally waking up every day going, oh, I'm a success. And now they're look for looking forward to creating more success. And you know this, what you focus on, you find more of. Mm -hmm. What you look for, you will find. Anyone listening to this, go look for blue cars today on the road when you're driving. You'll yeah. start to see more blue cars. That's the idea of focusing on success. So what happens is you'll start creating more and more success in your life. You'll feel like a success, you'll think of success, and you'll be a success. Instead of all the negative things that happened that day, you're a golfer, after a round of golf, do you focus on all the bad shots you had? <laughs> or do you remember the one great shot you had? Well, it depends what, what you feed. Right. There are people who are like, oh, man, I should have did that. And right. that. They forget about the good ones. But the one Yo, shot oh, makes yeah, you but the one you, you hey, crushed. I had one. I had one when we played. It yeah. was one. You did have one. One. <laughs> and that one, that one. It got you coming back. Yeah. It drove me to the range the next day yeah. after I was so bad. And so did being embarrassed how bad I played. But yeah. going to the range, I was like, you know what? That, that one shot, if I can recreate that, if I can practice, if I can get better, man, I can really enjoy this game if I improve. So, so that's how we start to be positive on the journey. But the idea is that you actually, people don't realize this, you can tune your brain, the antenna, to the positive on a daily basis instead of the negative. And this is a spiritual discipline or it could also be a very practical discipline. If you wanna look at the world in terms of scientific terms, do this every day and it will make you more successful happier and more positive, more spiritual, tune into the voice of God and the spirit of God yeah. every day. And you will become more whole, more healthy, happier, and more powerful in this world. Cause God actually wants us to tune into him so we can experience more oneness with him. And as we do, he then gives us his power mm -hmm. for us to be more powerful in this world, his wisdom, his guidance, his ideas, so that we can actually take on this world and overcome the challenges to be a powerful force for others. I love it. Amen. I, I want to talk actually about negativity, but I also want to edit, edify what you just said. So for me, you know, I call it my morning routine. I've been doing one for about, let's go say seven or eight years now. And it's, it's, it's the components you just listed, right? Like I, I start off with gratitude. I write three things I'm grateful for every yeah. single day. Um, I journal, you know, all the great things happening in my life, things I'm thankful for, you know, whatever, right? I pray, I read my Bible, um, I look at my goals, 
my task, like just everything. Right. And I do this every day. I've been doing it for seven or eight years and, um, you know, it's, it's transformed my life. Like I don't miss it like once, like, and it, it doesn't feel like a chore. It's right. just, it's a routine. It's a habit. And it's impacted my life tremendously. And I've been very consistent no matter what was happening around me. Like I've definitely had low points, but I've never veered off from doing that. Right. And you know, it's interesting because I've gone about resetting the culture in my company. I think we were talking about this on the course. And the first thing I did was just implement what I do. And just, that's what we do every day at nine o'clock. And so, you know, instead of me being the only one who, who does it, it's like, Hey, we're going to just make this part of a routine as a company. And so for 15 minutes, the first thing that they'll do in the team meeting for whatever department they're in, you know, cause we don't make everyone meet together. We do it at 9 AM on Mondays where I lead it for the entire company to set the tone for right. the week, but then they do it every day individually. Um, but we just go around, Hey, everyone share something you're grateful for. What happened this weekend, guys? Like what, what was cool? You do that. Second thing. Hey, like let's show some love to people that are making things happen. And so I'll be like, Hey, you know, he killed it. She did great. That's awesome. You know, just showing love. Then the third thing I'll do is like set the vision and the inspiration for this week. Like, Hey guys, these are the things we're going to accomplish. Let's go. This is the initiative. Let's get to work. And then at the end, we always end in prayer. Mm. And so we pray. Um, I just pray over the whole company and then we get to work. And that's, that's like, awesome. it, and you could see in the two months of doing that, it is night and day. And also, you know, what it has done too, is it's actually repelled energy vampires who are no longer here. Yep. It's crazy how that works. WealthCon's coming back to Vegas, January 8th to the 11th. Now, if you've been to our events, you know, how epic they are. We have the best time, not only with just great content, great speakers, but we have a lot of fun with the after parties and the masterminds and everything else. And number one, it's the, probably the best networking opportunity in the entire game. We have over a thousand investors and entrepreneurs at each one, and this will be no different. In fact, this is gonna be my favorite WealthCon ever. We've got some amazing speakers coming, people like Tim Tebow, Thatch Nguyen, Gabrielle Lyon, the list goes on. It is going to be an epic event and I wanna see you there. So if you're interested in attending, get your tickets now because they will not last. Go to wealthcon.org and get them today. Everyone knows that my favorite way to build wealth is through real estate investing. That's the reason that I started Wealthy Investor where we've trained thousands of students. But here's the thing. I've noticed that so many people fail to get started in real estate because they're worried about the money. They don't know where they're gonna get the money to buy a house or flip or handle their renovations and things like that. And so they just never get started. I wanna change that. And that's why I created a brand new free course that goes over five different ways that you could buy houses without using any of your own money today. And I'm gonna give you it completely for free. All you have to do is go to wealthyinvestor.com slash podcast. I've made it specifically for you. The moment you go to that link, you'll be able to go get access to it and learn how you can start buying houses today without any of your own money. And if you're somebody who already has a real estate business and who wants to scale, we wanna help you too. You can click the link below and book a free strategy call with our team if that's you. When you create a positive culture, mm -hmm. the energy vampires will get off the bus themselves because they no longer fit in. Yeah. The best thing you do is actually create that positivity that attracts more positive people. They want to work with you and it gets rid of the negative people that actually don't belong or don't fit in. Yeah. And it's interesting because I used to think like, so I'm an extremely optimistic and positive person, but I'm an extremely like demanding and driving. And it's like, Hey, you did great, but here's what we can do <laughs> right. next time to be better. Right. So it could be perceived as, a maybe half glass empty type behavior, even though it's not, it's right. like, no dude, like that was awesome that you did that. But here's what we got to do next time to be even better. Do you think that like, how do you perceive that? You know, it's interesting because I'm very similar in that way. You're a driver. Yeah. I'm a driver. We always want to get better ourselves. Yep. So then we push others to get better as well. Positive leaders are demanding. They're just not demeaning. So you're clearly not demeaning. You're demanding. You want people to get better. The research shows you want three to one positive to negative interactions with your team members. Okay. Four to one, five to one, seven to one, great as well. 
you want to get that number higher. So seven, eight, nine to one is great. But if you get the 13 to one, 13 positive to one negative, the team falls apart because mm. no one's dealing with the real issues. No one's making each other better. Mm. And so you need both. Again, you need some negative constructive criticism, criticism. How can we improve? How can we grow? And I don't even think it should be considered negative. It's, it's, Friction. It's just facts. It's challenging. <laughs> it's accountability. Yeah. It's like, okay, here's where you are. This is what it looks like to be great. Yeah. And here's where you are. And here's the separation. And I need you to move towards this. And here's some ideas to get there. Yeah. So that's great leadership to always be helping people improve. The challenge is when they always feel like it's not enough. So it's important to celebrate the wins. Mm -hmm. Hey, you did this. This is great. Let's celebrate the wins. I think there's moments for celebration and there's, there's moments for helping people get better. And I think sometimes if we are too quick to say, oh, we should do this, you could be better here. You could be better there. They lose the moment of celebration and they lose that good feeling they have. Yeah, you want exactly. them to experience that. Exactly. And I'm the same way. I'm told often, like you never sit in an area of, of just joy for long. You yeah. have this great accomplishment and we're already on to the next thing. And it's what makes us successful, but it also can make us, very unhappy <laughs> and make others around us at times unhappy. Yeah. So it's just a check and it's just like, okay, how can I improve more to add some more positivity to the interactions, more encouragement, more, more, more folks on what they're doing well instead of what not they're, what they're not doing well. Okay. Got it. Let's talk about negativity. So obviously we know what a super negative person looks like. I right. mean, they, they don't think anything's good. They live in fear. They think the worst of everyone or everything. And right. everything's always a second from falling apart, whatever, right? But in my mind, there's also like the negativity that fuels you to go do something great, right? You know, somebody slights you. You're like, okay, that's what you think. All right, well, let's, I'm going to go to work then. Um, or the negative, yeah, somebody doubting you, a chip on your shoulder, um, or the negativity of, you know, all the things going around you, right? Like, okay, yeah, this, this year, the economy has been, you know, not as easy. All right. That's like a negative thing happening. My response to that is, all right, it's time to buckle up and get to work. Not like, oh man, we're screwed. So it's like, but when things are rolling and good, I'm like, usually, oh, things are good guys. Like, it's all good. Like, <laughs> just, just keep doing what you're doing. It's all good. Like, what do you, how do you interpret that? Well, one, in leadership, the key is love and accountability together. Okay. So we love them up. We encourage them. We support them. But we have to challenge them along the way to the culture, to the standards, to the values, to the principles. So we're going to hold them accountable to, to that greatness. So no matter what, even when things are going good, we do have to along the way, make sure that we're still challenging, still pushing, still growing. I think you have to embed both in your culture of love and accountability. So it doesn't change because the circumstances can't define how you are leading. It can't be like, okay, we're doing great. It's like the NFL coach. Everyone knows in the locker room, the team is winning and the coach is really positive. He's got a certain attitude. They start losing. The coach changes when they start losing that coach will now lose the, the locker room. They'll lose the locker room as a result of that. Happens all the time. You've got to be consistent as a leader based on circumstances. So that's really key there to understand that. The other part of this is, is negativity. Negativity could be a powerful drug. It could drive you and push you and enrage you to create great outcomes. But that very drug will also destroy you. Mm -hmm. And so it could be a motivator but you have to recognize how it's motivating you. And hate will never make you great. <laughs> There's a part of it that actually drives you. There's a stubbornness. People say, you know, Michael Jordan, Kobe, they hated to lose. They feared losing. It's what made them great. No, it's part of the equation of what made them great. Because I hate to lose, you hate to lose. It's part of the equation. Mm -hmm. But it's not the ultimate driver. Love will make you great. And yeah. only love will drive it. So what is it? The love of competition. Mm. the love of competing, the love of battling. I Michael do love Jordan it. loved to destroy you. He loved to beat you. That is more powerful than the hate that drives you. Or the fear of losing. Or the fear of losing. So if fear is driving you to be successful, it will get you to a certain point, but eventually it will cause your demise. It's called constraint theory. Okay. Constraint theory says we have this constraint 
and you'll never rise above the level of your constraint. Hmm. So you're rising, 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 and then you have this constraint, this wound. Yeah. This thing that's holding you back. And what happens is so often we get there and then it pushes down and we don't heal it and it becomes our demise. Tiger Woods had a wound. It eventually played out. CEOs who have public failures, it plays out. Pastors, public failures. The wound plays out on the stage for others to see and it plays out in so many lives that we don't see because eventually what happens is the very things that make you successful in the short one, when they're not healed or they're not fueled by love and compassion and hope and joy and all the, the fruits of the spirit and all those attributes that truly make you great and create long-term sustained success, if they're fueled by these short-term drivers, eventually the fuel runs out mm -hmm. and you collapse. You need that high octane sustaining fuel that drives you. Yeah. No, that's great because I've seen, like, I've thought about this a lot because for you, I was listening to your story. I was like, because the original question I asked was, what fueled you to want to learn about energy? And like, how did yeah. you figure all this stuff out? And you basically said, I almost got divorced because I was so negative and everything. So I had to go learn why I was the way I was. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, this, this point forced you into doing that, right? The negative leads to the positive. And that's a duality of life. We're mm -hmm. always going to have good and bad, negative yeah, and positive. Yeah, because when things are rolling, I don't, I'm just like, I'm not forced to go try and make some big change. I'm like, just keep, don't mess it yeah. up. <laughs> did you have a rival growing up? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I did too. My good friend's writing a book now about rivals and worthy opponents. And he says that we have to have worthy opponents along the way. Yes. That make us stronger. I, I'm, I'm actually reading Patrick Bed David's new book. Okay. Choose Your Enemies Wisely. Okay. And I was like, huh, I wonder what this book's about. And I've, I'm listening to it on audiobook and I'm like an hour and a half in. And he's basically talking about that concept of like, you need to choose your enemy. Like you, you need a rival essentially. And that's what's going to fuel you. You need rivals. You need adversity. Yeah. You need struggles. All those lead to strength along the way. Every struggle leads to strength if you allow it to, if you grow from it, if you improve from it. But I got to say, people always say adversity makes you stronger. Not all adversity. <laughs> Only if you are learning from the adversity, right. growing from the adversity. If you don't allow the adversity to destroy you, it does make you stronger. Do you think it's a bad thing? Um, because people will be like, oh, well, you shouldn't compare yourself to others. And- for example, you asked if I had a rival growing up and it was like, well, yeah, no matter what level I was at, right? If I was 12 years old and we know who the top dog is on the team or, you know, we're playing against, I know exactly who it is. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to outplay that guy today. Right. And it's not like I want him to do bad because I don't want to outplay him because they went over four and I went one for four. Right. Like none of us did anything. Right. right? Like I want him to be his best and I want to know what it looks like and how I can top that. Yes. That gets you to a certain level of success. Mm -hmm. I was the same way. So you asked me, what drove me? If I'm honest, it was also the desire to succeed. Yeah. To be someone of value. To be someone whose ideas would be listened to from others. So I couldn't be a failure because my whole life as an athlete, I was driven to succeed for recognition. Yeah. For validation. Those things drive us. But again, if those are the core drivers of, of who you are, and what you are, then you're always defined by your performance, by your outcome, by your successes, never by who you truly are. And if that's the case, then when you're succeeding, you're defined by the success. But when you're failing, you're now defined by the success. Mm -hmm. And so you must be defined by something more. There has to be a different measuring stick. But along the way, again, those, those drivers of success of comparing, seeing what someone has and what they're doing, okay, where am I on that? It's a yeah, measuring stick. Exactly. It's a measuring stick. How do I need to improve? How can I get better? Where am I in this pecking order? And I want to get here. All right, great. It's going to make you stronger. But eventually what you want to do is get to a point where you are your own measuring stick in a sense where your desire for excellence, your desire to be the best that you can be, to fuel your growth, your knowledge, your wisdom, your skill in golf, whatever it is, you want to get better. Like let's look at tennis as a great example. You got Nadal, Djokovic and Federer. I thought about them a lot. Their rivalry made each other better as they battled each other. Yeah. But along the way, they were also striving for this excellence within themselves and this greatness. 
within them to be the best that they could be while they're battling each other. I think it's, that, yeah. I think it's, I think it's, it's, it's the two combined together. And that's what I think. Like for me, I'm like battling, uh, I would say myself like yes. to be the best version of me. Right. But it's like you, you see your competition and you're like, okay, well that's like where I need to get to. Right. I'm not like worried about people who are like, not where I'm at. That's not like, I don't want to be the big fish in a little pond. I want to like, okay, where's the lake at? Yes. You know, where are these big fish at? What are they doing? How do I get to that level? And it's not like I need them to do bad. I just want to know <laughs> That's like, what's possible. I think that's the healthiest way to look at it. Yeah. You look at someone and you say, look where they are and what can I take from that to get there? Exactly. What do I need to do to get there? But too many people look at someone else who's successful and they say, I can never be like that. And they Ooh. feel less than, and they feel unworthy. And they actually look at their insecurities and their doubts and all their inadequacies. The key is to say, not compare myself and go, oh, I can never be that. It's to take something from them and say, what do I need to do to get there or to be the best that I can be? How can I improve? I mean, yeah. we, have, we, have a, we have a good mutual friend in Ed Milet, right? Mm -hmm. I never want to be Ed Milet. Ed is Ed and he is incredible. But there's, but Ed working out and lifting. Yeah. First time I met him, I thought, we're the same age. He's jacked and I'm not. <laughs> but you're jacked. I, well, I, I, I am more now. I'm still working on it, but yeah. I am more now than I was because I was a former athlete who didn't work out that much. Yeah. So meeting my good friend, Ed, he inspired me to start lifting. Yeah. To start training. It made me better because I said, oh, that's an attribute that I want that I don't have. So I'm actually going to bring that attribute into my life. Mm -hmm. I see someone who might be successful in this world in terms of, um, you know, I've written a number of books, so, but John Maxwell, yeah. John Maxwell's 20 years, 25 years, perhaps older than me. Okay. Well, a lot of people say you're like, you know, they always call me the next John Maxwell. No, I'm John Gordon. John yeah. Maxwell doesn't have a Long Island accent and he didn't play lacrosse, <laughs> you know, but he's an amazing human being. I never want to be John, but there's things I can learn from John and how he shares his faith yeah. with a business audience and inspires them. So I look at John, I go, you know what? I want some of that. I want to learn how to be able to share my faith more in a way that's really allows people to come in and feel really comfortable as they come in. So there's an aspect to that. So I'm always looking at others going, oh, what, what, what do I need to have more of? Where do I need to be better? But it's never from a feeling of lack. Yeah. It's what do I need more of? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I'll tell you too, for me, I don't look at anybody that I don't think I can compete with, right? Because like, for instance, I could go look at LeBron. Right. And I'm like, yeah, it just ain't going to happen. <laughs> like, it, just, <laughs> it is what it is. I'll, I'll never play in the NBA and I ain't exactly. LeBron, right? So like I do set my rivals yeah. or people as, I'm like, yeah, if that guy can do it, I for sure can do it. Right. He's a normal guy. And that's what I love about business is because like, to me, anyways, I truly believe that business is an even playing field. Like, I don't believe that these guys have just these insane things that had made them so different than the rest of the world. Yeah, they they, they had better timing. They had uh, probably more hustle. Yeah. They're good at, like, they learned the skills they had to learn. But, like, the inherent natural ability, I think anyone can be great. I love that. Did you come from money? No. I didn't either. Most people I know who are very successful did not come from money. Mm -hmm. So it's not the fact that people grew up with money. As you said, it's an equal playing field. I love from a business standpoint that you can actually go out and you go create a product. You can create a service. You can take an idea and you can make it successful in this business world. And I think about my parents never made more than 30,000 a year combined. Wow. Combined. Okay. So I came, I came from money compared to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I grew up in the middle class, but my, my parents lost it all in 2008. Okay. So, so I, that, I get, that was kind of traumatic for me at like 17, 18 years old, like growing up middle class and then seeing just, it was all gone. But I bet that drove you. Oh, for sure. Cause you said, I will never be like that. I'm going to make money where I never have to go through that in my yep, family. Exactly. See, that's the other thing. Our past always prepares us for our future and the challenges we go through and the lessons we learn along the way are meant for us and our growth and how we're meant to live our life. So every time I meet someone, why they're driven in one way has to do with something they experienced in their course of their life that has driven them to be a certain way or do something on their journey through life. My good friend, Jamie Kernelima is writing a book called Worthy because she says that when she was younger, she felt unworthy. Mm. And so 
think about the you you want to help people with their wealthy kingdom yeah. and create wealth and success yeah because of what you experience and now you want to help others do the same i was very negative yeah i want to help people with their positivity <clears throat> and their optimism and their mindset as a former athlete d1 man there were so many times that i was mentally weak and not mentally strong right i know what that's like so i love helping that person i know has greatness within them to have the right mindset that will allow them to succeed and we're talking professional athletes who they're phenomenal athletes, but they are struggling with their mindset. Oh, I work bro, with a lot of so those. Many. I work with a lot of those guys. I resonate with them when they tell me how they're struggling. How did you get in with so many professional athletes? They all read my books. So as they read my books and started reading Training Camp, which is probably my favorite book, with the best do better than everyone else, and it's a book about excellence and mm. the winning habits that separate the best from the rest. That may that's a book that I want to read. Yeah, I think you'd love that one actually. Yeah. And what are some of the habits? Uh, so many, but the best do ordinary things better than everyone else. It's about the fundamentals. Mm. The best are mentally stronger. The best know what they want. Yeah. They all had a moment where they said, this is what I want. And I'm willing to pay the price that greatness requires to be great at it. You had that moment in golf where you said, I want to be great at golf. Yeah. And now you're willing to pay the price. I want to be great in business. I'm willing to pay the price. I said, I'm going to be a writer and speaker. This is what I'm going to do. And whatever it takes, I don't care how long it takes. This is what I'm going to do. So the best had that moment where they truly said, this is what I truly, truly want. And, and they so, just committed. Yeah, committed. There's 11 characteristics in that book. And the cool thing is Dabo Sweeney, when he was the head coach at Clemson, turned around his program in 2011. He shared one of those characteristics every week during the season and taught it to the team. And that was a turnaround year from him, almost being fired the year before. And ever since, they've been a, a top program Yeah. once they started focusing on what the best do better. So, yeah, I love that book. And so, so I write these books, you know, to help people with their mindsets, with their attitude, with their belief, with their leadership, with their teamwork. But, but the whole idea is I started writing these books because I've been on a quest myself yeah. to be better. And that led me to help others get better. And as I would write these books and people would read them, it would lead to conversations and that would lead to more books. Cause I go, Oh, this hasn't been written yet. And I need to write for that person who's struggling with that issue. Cause a lot of people are struggling with that issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting because I've had a lot, I would not call myself a philosophical person. Like I haven't gone searching for answers and things. Um, I've been on this just quest my whole life of just improvement every day. Right? Like, I mean, if you're an athlete, it's like, look, how do I just get better today? Right. I know I can't go win the championship tomorrow. It's just, right. it, it, it's six months away. It's the off season. I can't do anything, but right. just get better today. So that's kind of always been my mindset and it served well for many things. And then I've always just leaned on faith for, you know, everything. Right. So it's like, all right, I'll just lean on faith and I'll just get better every day, whatever it is I'm focusing on. And that's it. Like the most simplest mindset ever. And I don't have any other reason for anything. And people are like, so what fuels you? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, I just, <laughs> I just do this every day. I've lived this way a long, long time. It's gotten me to this point. I'm happy. I'm not going to even think about why I do it. And you don't want to think. Yeah. You do not, you do not want to overthink. Yeah. If it, if it works for you, you do it. When I work with athletes, I always tell them, if this works for you, <laughs> you do it. If getting angry fires you up, and cause you to focus and really allows you to, to dial in, then you use that fuel. Because I'm not saying, oh, you gotta always be positive because there'll be moments that you won't be positive, but be fierce. And if that challenge, that struggle, or that mistake cause you to be fierce, which then leads to more fuel. Because I always say some of the greatest things you can do is turn that frustration into focus, mm -hmm. fear into fuel, and failure into finishing strong. Mm. Then you use it. So don't overthink because so often we let our overthinking get in the way of over overcoming. Mm. And so what you're saying is great. Like if I was coaching you, I would say, no, it works for you. So you keep doing it. And I love the formula. Get better every day, control what you control. Yep. And then trust in God ultimately who is in control. Yeah. So you control your part and then you have faith in God for the things that you can't control. And that is actually a really sound way to live and lead also because you're focusing day in and day out. So it's one day at a time for you. 
Yeah, it is. You're just getting better each day. So you're really in the present moment. You're getting better each day. And then you're allowing God to guide you in ways that I wasn't prepared, prepared to do that. I wasn't thinking about that. Yeah. And then you get led in new directions. You're like, oh, okay. That's literally how it goes. And you see, you see the magic of that. That's how I live my life too. I really have a lot of faith. People say, don't you have to forecast five years from now, 10 years from now? No, because I never thought I'd be doing now what I'm doing right now. I never yeah. thought I would start a training company. We're doing leadership training. Mm -hmm. We're doing mindset training. We're doing all these kind of training programs for leaders and companies, but I would not have predicted that five years ago. Yeah, and that's what I try to tell people too. It's like, sure, I'm gonna go make 2024's goals of like, yeah, you know, this is these are the revenues we wanna hit. This is, you know, in each different thing, this is what, you know, the numerical measurable goal of what I wanna do. But in the end, whether or not I hit it, to me anyways, is kind of like, it doesn't matter. Right. I'm just like, it's there because it logically, that's what seems like I should do this year. Right. Um, but I'm not going to like kill myself because I'm not like on pace right. for the goal. Right. Because I just know if I do my very best every single day, like I'm just constantly doing the best and being the most efficient and everything I could possibly get out of that day. That's all that matters. Whatever the result is, it is that's so healthy to live that way. And it actually is very positive and leads to greater success because you're focused on the core mission yeah, and the purpose and the progress of getting better. And too often companies focus on the fruit of the tree mm. and they ignore the root focus on the fruit, ignore the root, the tree dies. Yeah. But if you invest in that root, which you're doing every day, getting better yourself and your relationship spiritually, and you do that every day over time, you get a great supply of fruit. Yeah. But the world is so focused on the outer and the outcome and they get mad when they don't hit their goals. I'm the same way. We never have number goals. I just talked to my accountant yesterday. He said, he goes, you know, like you're having your best year ever this year. I said, I thought we were doing well, but I didn't know we were doing this. Like, <laughs> oh yeah. You did X more this year than last year. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, wow, I had, I had no idea. But it wasn't like I got excited or even happy from it. I actually didn't. I wasn't happier from it. I'm like, oh, this is great. Okay. We're making progress. Awesome. All right. Let's keep on doing what we're doing. Mission and purpose drives me more than numbers. Yeah, 100%. So with, you know, just taking things day to day and habits and just doing the things, you know, one of the best um, selling books I think ever would be Atomic Habits. And I know that that book, you know, put James Clear on the map and yeah. just crushed it. Um, but, you know, he says a lot of interesting things in there about just, look, like success does not happen overnight. It's just the culmination of all these habits that have just compounded over time. Like, is that what you're seeing with all these successful people that you're coaching? Yeah, it's, it's doing those little <laughs> things day in, day out, showing up every day, and then just, just doing the work, not getting too far ahead of yourself, but focusing on the present moment, getting better every single day. The best are always striving to get better. That's one of the rules of, of training camp. So they're always striving. They're here today, tomorrow they improve. A week later they improve. Okay, you might have some fall off, you might have a setback, you might have an injury. Yeah. Okay, but then you get back on, you keep improving, you keep growing. And by the way, Atomic Habits, yeah, great book. And it's so funny, James Clear reached out before he even wrote that book and he was writing a newsletter at the time mm -hmm. and just wrote some great articles. And I I wove some of his articles with his approval and you went in the locker room first. He had a great story about Vince Lombardi. Mm -hmm. Vince Lombardi had a four day coaching clinic, mm -hmm. two full days. He devoted to the power sweep. Wow. Just one play, two full days. Why? Culture of execution, focusing on doing the little things better than everyone else, mastering the fundamentals. It's why, I, why he had such success. And that's what I find. I find when people focus on the fundamentals, it's your model. You work hard every day, you get better, and then you keep trusting and improving. And you know, we say trust the process. Yeah. I like to say trust in God who created the process. <laughs> trust but, the process maker. Yeah, exactly. Which needs to be a book, by the way. There trust we go. The process that's, that's my maker. next one. Don't that's, let John take it. That, <laughs> that's, someone's going to do it right now, by the way, yeah. if, if they hear this. Trust the process maker. That's a great one. Yeah. No, I love it. My, um, I don't think I've ever said this, but... Uh, my grandpa actually played for Vince Lombardi. Whoa. So um, I come from a line of athletes and uh, my great grandpa was an Olympian water polo player. And then my grandpa played for the Packers 
He went to Alabama. No way. He, um, you know, played for the Bears as well. And then my mom played at UNLV for tennis. And then obviously I played pro baseball. So like we have a long line of just nobody stuck to the same thing. It's why you could hit like a pro golfer after playing for only two years. Unbelievable. Yeah. It's just genetics. Talk or, about genes. Yeah. So we'll see what my kids end up doing. But uh, All right, what happens if they're not great athletes? I don't care. Yeah. Like, you know, I did see that growing up with parents who were just so like trying to put their dreams on their kids. Like right. I never, by the way, people thought this, they're like, did your dad like force you to do all the things you did? Cause I was a super hard worker. Even when I was, you know, 13 years old, I was like, dad, I want to go to the batting cage and bust everyone up. Like I want to be the best, like get me whoever, get me the best coach. Just let me go to the cage. Let me start working out. I'm like, I'm 14 years old. I want to start working out. You know, I want to do speed training. I want to do all these things that I think will help me get an edge. And um, he always just found a way to get me there. But people thought he was like trying to force me to do those things. And I'm like, no, I'm telling him I want to do those things. And, you know, the cool thing about my dad, too, is that he never like he he does not come from a line of athletes. He's from the Philippines where there ain't no athletes. There's Manny Pacquiao and that's it. And, you know, for him, he was like, dude, like my dad has never thrown me batting practice. We might have played catch a couple times in my life. He's not an athlete. Right. And it's cool. He was like, yeah, I will support you when that, I will get you the guys you need. There was no competition with him. There was no expectation from him. No. It was more just appreciation and time there was, together. There was always support because even as I got older and I started to get, you know, good, um, I would say around high school was when, like, it was clear that I was going to be pretty good. Yeah. Um, he literally came to every game, filmed every at bat, not that uh, I, like, he just did it, right? right? And then I would watch the film back myself. He would never be like, dude, I think you were like doing this. or that." He, right. I would just look at it and I'd be like, all right, that's what I need to do next game. And he's like, all right. And compare that to a lot of parents now who are just so obsessed with their kids' performance and but then focus you, on that but, too But then much. you hear the stories of like, um, like I love the Will Smith movie with um, Venus and Serena. Oh, yeah you know, King Richard. And then, you know, you see, you hear about like Tiger's dad and, you know, like these, these hyper obsessive parents that like form their kids into, you know, these, these machines. But the, I, pro the problem is we think that should be the case for every kid. But I assume the kid also, like, I think it was a joint thing. Like I, I would imagine if my dad was like Tiger's dad or, or whatever, like we would have been like that of right. like, oh yeah, we're both driving. You know, it's not like, I don't think Tiger Woods was forced to play golf, right, you know, right. he wanted to be great. It could be dangerous though, again, as someone who was sometimes too focused on as a parent. Yeah. Like, I have to be honest, like, when my kids were growing up, sometimes I drove a little too hard. I grew up in, you know, New York where, you know, again, there was a lot of competition. Then I'm now living in Jacksonville, Florida with my kids. Who's from Jacksonville, Florida? Tim Tebow. Yeah. So Tim Tebow is a star athlete. Everyone thinks their kid is going to be the next Tim Tebow. <laughs> So where I live, everyone's pushing their kid to be the next Tim Tebow. No, there's one Tim Tebow. There's a great cartoon of a kid in a batter's box, and the dad is yelling at the kid. It says, hey, dad, you're yelling at a future software developer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's not going to be yeah. an all-star. Yeah. So just encourage him. Like, your dad had the best model. When I think yeah. about that, the way your dad was to you, like, that's the way to be. Yeah. Even, even... Even if you think, okay, my kid has potential and there's a King Richard, that's such a rare occurrence. Oh, for sure. Where you have yeah, we're talking like literally that. the best ever. Right. <laughs> and, and we think, okay, that, I have to be that way now. No. More often than that, you will ruin your kid yeah, don't if do you push way. them too hard. Yeah, I mean, and then you, you got the other side. Like, you go look at Tebow. His parents were missionaries. Right. You know, like, he, right. he wasn't He doing wanted that. it like you. Yeah, like he just, just was self-motivated to go just, out and make You were happen. just wired that way. Wouldn't you say yeah. that? You just grew up being wired that way. And I, I asked, um, I don't even remember who I had on the show, but you know, kind of a mindset guy. Yeah. I was like, where do you, where does it come from? Where does motivation come from? Right. Because we're, we're talking about positivity and we're talking about fear yeah. and you know, there, you know, there's these, these guys are like, well, it always comes out of fear at the end of the day. Yeah. Right. And I'm it's like, I don't true. know. I don't feel like I'm, I, I don't fear losing money. I don't fear any of this stuff, like, I just want to be great. Yeah. Like, where does it come from? It comes from the essence of who you are. It comes from your soul. Mm. 
It comes from your soul. Your soul is your unique spiritual DNA of who you are. It's the ultimate expression of who you are. And at the soul level, psyche means soul, by the way. Oh. Psyche means soul. It was never meant to be about the brain. The brain is, again, just the hardware. It's where the activation happens. It's the soul and the mind that drives the brain. The mind and the brain are two different things. Yeah. So you have this soul that, that is living out this reality. What happens when you die? Your well, body turns to yeah. dust. Yeah. Everything about you turns to dust. But there's this soul, this essence of who you are. I believe that soul is an eternal soul. Yeah. So it's here in this temporary world. Yep expressing itself in this temporary world, but it's an eternal soul. And it's meant to express Ryan Pineda this way to be who you are, to learn, to grow, to face adversity, tri trials, challenges along the way. And you are wired that way because your soul actually is designed that way to be this way, to be who you are. Mm -hmm. So obviously God created us in a unique way, right? Yes. And you know, the soul, the talent, the body, like he already knew yes. what was going to happen. And so I struggle with that, um, you know, I guess for some people, because, you know, on one hand, people will say, well, you know, the way you're, you've grown up is going to dictate your belief system and who you are and what you do and how you, negativity, positivity, belief. Um, like, how do you, how do you, I guess, look at those two things where yeah. like, yeah, your circumstance for sure is going to dictate kind of like your belief system and you know that, but then you do have this soul and this natural God given DNA yep. that's going to also be trying to, I guess, fight your circumstance. There are multiple factors that play out in who you become and ultimately who you are, but it's never the circumstance. Mm. It's never the environment because two kids can grow up in the same exact environment and become and grow into be very different human beings. And so you face your circumstance. They reveal part of you. They are part of your growth process. They're part of your journey. One person faces a rival and they crumble. The other person faces a rival and they rise above. They triumph. So it's never the circumstance. It's never the event. It's never actually the environment. Two kids grew up literally in a very challenging, difficult socioeconomic environment. Yeah. One kid becomes a gang member. Another kid becomes a neurosurgeon. Yeah. But we blame the environment. See, that's society and that's the myth of a lot of psychology that's out there because we're always looking at environments and when we do, we're creating victims. Yeah. Oh, you grew up in this environment so that's why you are the way you are. Now, yeah. again, if we measured the research, we would say that X amount of kids won't graduate in this environment. They'll yeah. go to prison in this environment. That's because there's a belief system in that environment. And thoughts and beliefs create the reality. Right. But there are some kids that have a different belief system in that environment. Like, I don't care. They, I don't care. I'm going to create my future. I'm going to make my way out of this. Yeah. And I'm going to define a new reality for me and my family. Happens all the time. Yeah. It's the belief system. So we're measuring a belief that is a belief in a lie. Mm. That this circumstance creates your reality. That kids who grow up in this environment, that go to this school, will turn out this way. We're actually measuring a lie and measuring the belief in a lie. This is really deep when you understand it. Yeah. But it's so powerful because once you understand it, and I wrote the one truth so that people would understand, no, I'm not going to live this life based on my circumstances. I'm going to live this life based on my vision, on my optimism, mm. on my belief and what's possible. And now I realize I have the power to transform my circumstance. Mm. I have the power to overcome my circumstance. See, that's real power. And psychology frustrates me a lot in this all these mindset myths that I say are out there, yeah. people believe in this stuff and it gets perpetuated and it's actually One not One report true. goes as like fact. Oh yeah. And then it weakens people because they start to believe oh, in that That's lot. fact. That is what it is. Yeah, that is what it is. There's you no know, overcoming it. They, you grew up in that environment or, you, you know, you face this trauma. So, you know, you're more likely to be this way. Two kids could deal with the same trauma. Yeah. And one kid rises above and winds Basically, up becoming a Basically, you can be the healer. outlier or not. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. Yeah, an outlier, but also there's no reason to believe that because you had that experience that you should be this way. Yeah. I think we can all be outliers is the it, point. Exactly, right? You just, one is choosing to accept a circumstance, the other is not. Right, one is a victim, one overcomes and becomes yeah, and lives the victory life. Yeah. So what would you say, like, 
motivates a guy like Tom Brady, right? Because I think when you look at certain athletes, they're guys like LeBron and Jordan, who were clearly great their entire life. Um, I would say a guy like Brady, yeah, I mean, he is obviously good and, you know, he's good enough to get drafted right. right at the end. And it's not like his college numbers were crazy. Um, it's not like his physical ability is crazy. You look at Jordan or LeBron, it's like, yeah, they were physically way better than everyone. Their, their play backed it up. They were best in the country, best in high school. And Brady's a guy who was like, not that. Mm. Yet you look at him just constantly rising to the occasion and overperforming his, you know, I guess, uh, body, his physical limitations. Right. And, you know, how is that? You look at Brady and you also understand that when he was in college, he struggled mentally at times and had a mental coach that helped him a lot during that time. So it wasn't like he was always like Tom Brady, like he is now. I believe along the way, you develop some confidence. You develop this mindset that says, you know what? Why not me? I can be the best and I'm going to be the best. He's also so mentally tough and, and mentally strong. Ultimately, I think he has a lot of grit. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a formula for grit. There's been a lot of <laughs> books about grit and obviously Angela Duckworth is the foremost researcher on grit, but, but my formula- There's researchers on grit? Yeah. I got to hear the research on grit. Oh, she has a whole book on grit and- <laughs> What does grit comprise of? Well, <laughs> it's the desire to work hard for a long period of time, the ability to do it, to persevere, okay. to overcome, and to keep moving forward in the face of rejection, failure- and adversity. So it's like you have passion and purpose and drive for long-term goals. You do not give up along the way. And she studied the military, people who stayed in the military, people who fought, people who dropped out. She was studying all these different athletes and military and so forth. A lot of great research on grit. But knowing her work and also having a lot of experience with athletes and my own thoughts that came to me, I created a, a formula. And grit is inspired by vision and purpose it is fueled by optimism and belief. It's powered by faith and hope. It's driven by love. If you don't love it, you'll never be great at it. No one has to make Tom Brady work harder or work more. He loves it, so he loves the grind. He's gonna work hard. Devotion drives discipline. The more devoted you are, the more disciplined you will be. If you try to be disciplined without devotion, it's not gonna get you far because you're always swimming upstream, climbing uphill, it's hard to be disciplined when you don't love it. But when you love it, it's a lot easier. Grit is also kept alive by stubbornness. Like when you're stubborn, you keep going. And it's, it's revived by resilience. There's a resilience factor where somehow, some way, you just will not give up. And if we're honest, it includes a little fear of failure and desire to prove oneself. Big part of it is proving oneself. Tom Brady always wants to prove himself. You want to prove yourself. I want to prove myself. The best want to prove themselves. There's a part of them that says, maybe I don't have it today. I got to go out and prove myself. And that's a big part of grit. So that's my formula. And I think Tom Brady has all those characteristics. Mm. No, I love that. I was thinking about it um, when you said the desire to just not quit and persevere and do something for a long period of time. And the first thing I thought about was, you know, I played minor league baseball for eight seasons, making 1200 bucks yep. a month. And you just think about that and you're like, could you do that for eight years straight right? and not make it? I couldn't do it. Yeah. But you could, because that's something you were working towards, something you loved. For me, I could actually travel on the road like I did when I first started speaking for years when the energy bus was, was not successful yeah. and get out there and stay at the worst hotels possible. Yeah. Travel and coach, fly all over, yet show up with a 10-person audience, 20-person audience, 50, Make it and happen. so on. Again, that's what drove me. And, yeah. a, and a big part of along the way, we talked about mindset earlier, you got to talk to yourself, not listen to yourself. Yeah. I think that's my best advice ever is don't listen to the negative thoughts. Don't listen to the negative voices that come into your head because they're not from you. Talk to yourself with words of encouragement. Are you big on life. like the affirmations of like speaking to yourself in the mirror and stuff? No. Okay, good. Because I, I was like, dude, when I see people do that, I'm like, 
that is so lame. <laughs> like you just, you, you are great. Gosh you darn are, it. People like me, but, but here's the thing. People like me. I'm successful. <laughs> I, I look at them like, dude, I can't stop by okay. cracking up. I don't do that. And I never have, but I do <laughs> believe that as a man thinks he becomes. Yeah. That's biblical. I do believe those as things. a woman thinks. Yeah. She becomes the words you say, the words you think become the life and the reality that you live. So I was with the University of Texas football, who's now in the college football playoffs. Yeah. I was speaking to them during training camp. And I told them a story about my wife, who was being really negative and complaining a lot. She said, I'm getting old. My body's breaking down. I'm sore all the time. I'm not going to be like I was when I was younger. I should stop working out. It's just not working. It's, it's pointless. She just give up. She's being so negative. I'm like, honey, you gotta be positive. Let's get positive. She was <laughs> shut up, positive guy. You don't want to hear what happened. She's to like, say. I've heard this yeah. too long. I go away to a speaking engagement, come back after two days, completely different person. She's all positive, all happy, all optimistic. I'm like, what's going on here? Did you find a boyfriend or something? <laughs> she goes, No, no, I, I talked to that health coaching company. I had to Zoom with them. They did that testing on me where they test your blood work, your genes, and your DNA. And they said, this is really rare. We don't see this often. They said, you have the genes of an Olympic athlete. So now she's walking around saying, I am an Olympic athlete. <laughs> I am an Olympic athlete. Like not in the mirror, but she's thinking different. I am. She starts working out. Mm. She's an Olympic athlete. She starts getting more fit. The soreness goes away. The pain goes away. She stops complaining. Did you, did you just pay this doctor? Like, how do you have the genes of an Olympic athlete? Wouldn't that be like, cool <laughs> if I did pay them or funny <laughs> if I paid them? No. The, the, the genes are like this endurance kind of genes that allow you to actually sustain a lot of rigorous athletic work over a long period of time. Oh. And so like, it's like this endurance gene that she has that you only see in these Olympic athletes. And so it really is rare. And she actually does have that athletic ability to do that. Mm. She was a D tennis player at 40, first started playing tennis and was an A player within mm -hmm. like a year or two. Wow. And so she has great genes but she would always say that the kids got her genes because they were great athletes yeah growing up and i'd say honey i was a division one athlete <laughs> you didn't play sports in high school but you don't have the gene she goes, but you don't have the genes yep yep but so now she's taking credit for the rest of our life since she actually got this testing done yeah but the whole thing was her mindset changed because she believed something different she believed something and the words she was saying was different so i i believe people say affirmations and the reason why they don't work is because they don't really believe it yeah I believe it's good to say it. If you say I am strong, I am powerful. I did this with Texas, going back to the story. Had the players, after I told them the story about my wife, and by the way, they were giving me a hard time saying, oh, when, when you got home, she was away, your wife was with somebody. Like they were giving me a hard time. <laughs> like, These college kids, you know, yeah, college yeah. athletes. I'm like, guys, guys, it was a virtual meeting, okay? She wasn't meeting with the health coach. <laughs> so we had a great connection in that moment as they were laughing at me and I'm talking to them. I go, okay, guys, we're going to stand up. I want, I want different guys to say, I am, and add a word after that. And one guy said, I am strong. Another guy said, I am a warrior. Another guy said, I am enough, which was powerful with some tears in his eyes. Like it was an incredible moment, like this experience. So they were saying that. And then I go to the weight room an hour later, I'm in the weight room, the strength coach is in the middle of the team. They're encircled around the strength coach and he yells, I am, and they yelled, my brother's keeper. Mm. he yelled I am they yelled my brother's keeper it was incredible after my session I'm like wow they took it to another level that I could have ever even imagined yeah what happened they were speaking life getting more connected speaking life into who they were to each other so again I saw the power of words and thoughts and I saw how this plays out they're in the college football playoffs I told Sark the head coach after uh, training camp as they were about to start the season I said you're going to beat Alabama Mm. I've never seen anything like this with a, with a team that happened here. Like you guys are so connected. You're going to be a team that beats Alabama and they did. So I don't believe in saying in the front of the mirror, but I believe that you need to speak life. And I would say as an athlete, like, like I got this. Yeah. Let's go. I didn't come here to be average because yeah. I would have fear. No, I didn't come here to be average. No regrets. Let's go. I got this today. Yeah. So I would, I would talk to myself a lot like that. And I think self-talk, is very helpful as an athlete. If the negative thoughts are really powerful, like if those negative thoughts are coming in, you gotta talk to yourself more. Best is to have no thought. Yeah. 
where you're actually in the moment and in the flow and in the zone so much, you're not even thinking. That's truly when you're at your best. But if the negative thoughts are coming in, positive thoughts to combat them are very helpful. Yeah. You know, how much do you think your actual experience plays a role into develop, like, you know, it's this compound effect, right? Right. You believe it, it actually happens. It reinforces your belief and your faith and it just keeps on compounding and snowballing because like everybody starts from somewhere, right? You're not just this big successful person off the bat, right? It starts with a small win. Then you start believing that, yeah, I can accomplish something. Like I'd done this before. And I mean, like if I look at my life, that's how I feel is that I've ventured into many different things and I've had success in many different things. I've also had a lot of failures, but I, I've always bounced back from the failures. So I just know I have, somebody told me this one time, they're like, are you still alive? And I'm like, yeah. Well, you have a hundred percent success rate of overcoming failure. You're, you're still here. Yes. And I was like, that's true. You know? Yeah. I have a hundred percent success rate of getting through stuff. There's a myth though that says that your confidence comes from the wins that you have. Okay. From the preparation. People even say confidence comes from preparation. And it's just not true. That's another myth. Because there are moments that you haven't prepared, but you had to go up and hit the shot. Yeah. Or make the play. Or get ready to play in the game. And you played great, even though you didn't prepare. There's times that you come back after an injury and didn't play a lot, and you have the game of your life. Yeah. What happened? It was your state of mind. It wasn't the circumstance. Also, you have the win. Okay. You have a win. You have another win. But I know professional athletes who had a lot of wins, and they step up into a big moment. And in that moment, they don't feel confident in that moment. They feel insecure. Yeah. They feel nervous because their state of mind is such. Yeah. So it's never about, oh, the preparation, or oh, you've won before. You know what it was? The very belief you had in the first place that made you successful in the first place after you face adversity or a setback, it's the very belief that was in you in the first place that allows you to be successful after the adversity. Mm. That's the essence of who you are. That's the essence of your belief. You had it before, and then you have it again. I've overcome. Well, guess what? I've overcome before, and now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it again. So you have these, these experiences, but it's, again, it's not the experience. It's the essence and the belief you had before the event even happened. And after the event, you have it again, if that makes sense. Yeah. When I look back um, at my playing career versus my business career, one thing I've been thinking about a lot in self-reflection is, like, sometimes I'll, I'll think, I'll be like, why didn't I make it, you know? Like, I, I gave it everything I had. Like, I can't sit there and be like, well, you know, I wish I just didn't party. I wish I would have worked a little harder. Like I did all the right things. And I look back to why I didn't make it. And I'm not going to blame like, oh, these guys are just bigger and stronger because they're not. Like, right. yeah, they are, but right. I could have, I had the physical talent to do it. Yeah. And I go, so what, what was missing? Well, it was the mental side. I was missing the mental side as, you know, I'm 34 now. I wasn't that the way I am when I was 21, mm. when I got drafted. And I think about it a lot because- Back then, I would get so nervous and so, I guess, anxiety during the actual game. And there were times where it was just gone and I didn't have to worry about it. But the moment I made an error, it was like, oh, crap, dude, don't hit me another ball. Like, this is embarrassing. You know, I'm going to screw this up. And I lived with that my entire career and never went away. It was just always a roller coaster of doubt and anxiety and... um letting the result dictate my confidence the next day. And so if I had a string of a slump or a couple layers, all of a sudden I believed I was just a terrible, you know, defender. If I had um, a lot of good plays, I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm just great, yep. you know? And so I was letting my, my results do that and I just could never overcome it. And then now I look at business and I don't have any anxiety and I don't have any like fear. Um, and I don't know if it's because I have so much time to process a decision versus sports is a split second thing. You also don't know if it's going to come to you or not. Like you're just waiting. Um, all this stuff is happening. Whereas here I'm like, okay, I've sat here. I've analyzed, I've looked at it. I'm going to make a decision. This is it. And now it's kind of like out of my hands. I don't know. It's, it's a weird thing. I think it's the fact that that sports in many ways was your identity. Yeah. And 
you were tied to the performance and the outcome because it defined who you were. Yeah. Because it was so important to you. Yeah. And you worked so hard. And this is was everything to you. And it became your God. I put a lot of pressure. And yeah. And you put sure. a lot of pressure as a result. I wish I could have coached you then when you were that yeah. 21 year old. Yeah. Ryan, because when I wrote the one truth for for Ryan, for the Ryan who was 21 years old and struggling and trying to make it in the top of the top of their profession, because so often we get tied into that to that outcome mindset, that performance mindset, and then we get anxious. And we actually associate the circumstance or the event or the failure as a result of, you know, I failed at this circumstance, so now the next circumstance, I'm worried again. But remember, you had a failure, you made a mistake. When you're in a high state of mind, you make the mistake and you move on from it. You're like, all right, next play, let's go. Yeah. And there were moments where you made mistakes and you just rushed it off and, and made the next play or you struck out. Next time you came at bat, great at bat. But there were other times when you made the mistake and you're in a low state of mind. And when you're in a low state of mind and you made the same mistake that you made when you're in a high state of mind, but now it really bothered you and caused you to think a lot. So what you would have learned back then is it was never about the circumstance. It was always your state of mind in that moment. Yeah. State of mind is high. It doesn't bother you. Move on. State of mind is low. Circumstance happens and now it bothers you and you hold, held on to it. So at that time in your life, you were in a lower state of mind. Yeah. Now you're in a higher state of mind. But I also believe that business is not necessarily your identity and you know that now. 100%. And so it's actually not driving you in the same way in an unhealthy way. Now it's a healthy ambition. There's a lot of healthy ambition to this and wanting to be successful. But like you said, your, your worth is not being defined now by how much money you make or what success you have. Yeah. No, I, I 1000% agree about identity and making that an idol, making that your God. Um, I was guilty of that for sure. And I look back at my life and, you know, just looking at like, um, the way I was living and the way that I live now today. And I'm like, man, no wonder God didn't let me, you know, go down that path and, and reach it because I look, I, I now look at it. I'm like, man, like life is just so much better right. without it. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting. And it's, you, you have this, uh, like you said, lower state of mind. And I, there were definitely times where I was just like, and I had to like convince myself of this. I would like have to trick my mind and be like, I just really don't care. Whatever right. happens this game, I yeah. don't care. Because I did see so many guys like that that made it and who were very good. They were so carefree, dude. Like, and obviously it was important to them too. It was just as important to them as it was to me. Right. Yet they somehow approached it differently where they're like, dude, whatever. Like, uh, and, and maybe even too, like I look at some of them too and they would still like not care about like whatever's going to happen that night. Like if they, they were going to go party or whatever. And I'm over here thinking, well, dude, I got to like get my sleep and be, you know, putting so much pressure on myself. And I'd watch these guys and I'm like, they still go out the next day. They don't care. They just make it happen. Now there's certain limitations to that, but like it, it always struck me how they just didn't care. Right. Cameron Dicker, the kicker, who is the kicker for the chargers. Now he was a kicker for the Texas Longhorns. I had him on my podcast and he said, he approaches every kick. I'm just going to focus on doing my job and kick the ball. That's what I do. I'm just going to kick the ball. <laughs> I kick said, a ball. And if I miss, he goes, my life is still going to be fine. Yeah. My girlfriend's going to love me. My family will love me. And I'm going to be just fine. and I'll be happy. That's his approach. And he is so steady, so calm, doesn't care. He just kicks, but doesn't care. You know what I think it is for me, the more I think about it, though, is... I think in team sport, I did not want to let my teammates down. Mm. And that made me feel a lot of pressure because like when it comes to money and stuff, I don't care. I'm just like, yeah, like if I have a bad year, I had a bad year. It's all good. It doesn't bother me one bit. Right. Um, we still, the employees still got paid, you know, it's all good. And because I know I'll be fine. Like right. I know I'll, I'll just keep grinding and I'll figure things out and it's all good. But in team sports, you know, when you play poor, it affects everyone else. You know, you affect the outcome for all these people. And I guess that's true in business. Like if I don't, you know, try and keep getting better and improve this, it will affect the employees. But like, I already know it's just different. 
tell me if this is the case. This is what's coming to me. Okay. You feel like you can control your destiny in business. But in baseball, you didn't always feel like you could control your destiny. I do feel way more in control in business, for sure. Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. I think, I think in baseball, there was this feeling of not always having this control of how well you're going to play. You wanted to control it so much. It's why you worked so hard and prepared so hard. You actually were, were overbearing or too focused on that because you were trying to control it so much yeah. that you didn't make room for miracles. Yeah. You were trying to be God. Mm-hmm. instead of trusting in God. Yeah. And when you try to be God, it separates you from God. So I bet you didn't really feel connected to God during those times as well. Am I correct? I mean, I was still, um, you know, I obviously still had faith and everything, faith, but not but as connected. connected. Not as connected. Right. And now there's this connection where, you know, there's a stronger connection. Yeah. And in that connection, that gives you power. Yeah. In that connection, that gives you peace, that gives you wholeness. Whereas the separateness that you feel or you felt when you were that player, that allowed for the weakness to come in, the division to come in, and that negativity and anxiety to come in. The root for the Greek word of anxious means to separate and divide. Mm. So when you were anxious, you felt separate and divided. And it's why you felt so out of control and so weak and powerless in many ways, which Mm -hmm. added to the anxiety. Yeah. Now you feel one, you feel whole, so you feel powerful, and you feel like you are in control of your destiny. Mm -hmm. You know, it's. um, I thought of this new saying well, it's funny because like authors always have like all these different sayings right. and things. So I've had two <laughs> sayings recently that have just come up naturally for me because they keep coming up as themes. And one, you, you talked about ambition and I was just thinking about this, like for wealthy kingdom, I'm like, really ambition's not what I'm searching for. What I'm searching for is obedience. Mm. And I was thinking of like making a shirt or something that said obedience over ambition. And I think that that's like something a lot of entrepreneurs, especially Christian entrepreneurs, really need to lean into of like, are you going to trust being obedient to what God's calling you to do? Or are you going to go with your own selfish ambition? Mm. And it's an interesting thing to think about. I like that. I like that. But I also think there's healthy ambition. Like, yeah. Like Irwin would talk about this and say that there's a healthy ambition when you're actually focused on the mission that God has given you. But that first starts with obedience. Okay. Yes, of course. I love that. So obedience comes first. That leads to, okay, I got the download. Yes. That leads to the healthy ambition. Yeah. I would say connection and oneness leads to the, the connection that leads to the obedience, which then leads to the, to the, to the healthy ambition. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. It's like mother Teresa. Someone asked her to pray for, for clarity. Mm -hmm. She goes, no, I never pray for clarity. I pray for you to have a connection with God. Mm. And he will give you clarity. Yeah. It's for the first things first. Obedience comes first. Yeah. God comes first. And in that relationship, in that oneness, in that connection, everything comes after that. Yeah. That's good. So you want to be more obedient to his will rather than your own will. <laughs> yeah. And in and that will, that desire then will be My your desire. desire. Yeah. And that's the thing too. It's like, you know, we, we say we want to follow God's will, but what if God's will for you is to you know, go become a missionary, right? To give up the business or or whatever the case is. You know, are you willing to do it? Because the business and the status and the success and you know everything else. Um, I would do it tomorrow. Would you? Oh yeah. If I was asked to give up everything and be obedient in that way, yeah, I would do it in a heartbeat. Mm. In a heartbeat. I've thought about this. My wife and I even talked about this. Even during COVID, we talked about it. Like if writing is, is over if the career of a speaker is over because we didn't know what the world was going to look like. Right, right. I was like, Did, you know does what? the world need speakers yeah. anymore? <laughs> Whatever God wants me to do, I'll do. And it's that obedience that allows me to actually be carefree in some ways as you're going back to that carefree attitude. Like, all right. Like, it brings peace. It yeah. brings comfort. It brings, it brings the understanding that I'm not in control and whatever is meant for me, I'm willing to do it. You know, and this is what I'll say about peace is the right word for what we're talking about. Because back then when I got drafted, if I did not make it to the big leagues, I did not know what would happen. Right. Because I had no skills beyond baseball. Like I just, I didn't know anything. I wasn't successful at anything else in my life, but baseball. And so there was this, this fear of, well, dude, if I don't make it, then what? Right. 
Whereas now there's multiple levels of peace because it's like, oh, well, if like things go sideways, I already know how to rebuild it. That, that'll be fine. There's also the piece of, well, I also know where I'm going when this is all over. So like, what at this point do I have to fear? What, ma- like, it doesn't matter. Yeah. I always say, I don't fear dying. I just fear dying a tragic death. <laughs> <laughs> a slow. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't fear dying. I just don't want to actually be eaten by a lion or something like that. I just want to die in my sleep. Exactly. <laughs> just peacefully. Exactly. Yeah. I don't want to be painful death. Yeah. Well, dude, man, there's so many things I could talk to you about, but, uh, man, it's just so insightful. Um, I love talking to guys like you where I can like bounce ideas off that I've been thinking about. And I just, you know, there's not really many people that understand them and have written many books on them. Um, so I think I gained a lot of clarity today and hopefully others watching this or listening can take some feedback from this and start, uh, you know, I, I would say just not making work your identity and also just like having the positive vibes, like get rid of the energy vampires, like totally. just go for it. Yeah. It was a blessing talking to you. And I just, I love what you're doing and the fact that you are out there being a voice for, for so many right now, it's, it's, it's incredible to watch. Like my son is how I found out about you initially. <laughs> you know, my son who's 23, like, like you're the voice for his generation and the voice for all these younger people coming up and they look to you and they listen to you and they learn from you. And you're a great model for them because you're successful in business, but you also have this, this great faith and a great family and you lead the right way. And there's integrity. Like there's no gap in your character between who you are, what you say and what you do. There's this integrity, this alignment. And I always say that's your foundation. Like when you have integrity and you have character, that's the foundation that allows you to really soar and rise high. Like when they build skyscrapers, they don't just start building the skyscraper. They have to go down deep. Mm. They dig really deep to the depths to build that strong foundation. Well, that depth is your character, your integrity. And you have to dig down deep if you want to rise high. And it's so clear that you're doing that in, in your life and your work and your business and your influence. So I'm just thankful there are amazing leaders like you Younger than me, <laughs> coming along, more, more successful, richer, making an amazing impact, but yet showing people what it looks like to actually do things the right way. So I appreciate that. Thanks oh, thank for being you. that voice. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, guys, hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, make sure you go follow John. We'll link to him down below and we'll catch you on the next one. Peace. The higher you move in your commitment to being the best in the world, the smaller your margin of error. Most of the people I work with know how to handle the weight of failure. They do not know how to handle the weight of success. As long as you're comparing yourself against someone else, you're not the best.